Frontiers of Science lecture this year. And I'm not surprised to see so many people coming up for this lecture. I think everyone's interested in the origins of our universe and our history. And we've got a great talk tonight. Uh, it's really a pleasure that our two speakers, wherever they are, they're right here. Kyle Dawson, Professor Kyle Dawson, and Professor Gail Zasowski, if I got it correct, are both here at the University of Utah, the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And they're gonna be telling us a little bit about their research on the structure and the composition and the history of the universe. So I thank you both for putting this lecture together for uh, the audience tonight. Uh, our lecture tonight kicks off the 52nd year of Frontiers of Science lectures. And uh, this is the longest running lecture series at the University of Utah. Our lecture is gonna be taped tonight and it'll appear on YouTube in about a week. So you gotta smile, speakers, because you're gonna be on YouTube. And uh, so if you have friends who could not attend, uh, please share that information with them or if you wanna look at the lecture again and say, did they really say that? Is that really true? Uh, I ask you that you, you kindly silence or turn off your cell phones. You can just take a second and do that. Uh, there'll be a reception after the lecture. There'll be some cookies and juice out in the lobby, and you'll have a chance to meet the speakers and ask questions, and, uh, and there'll be other faculty as well outside in the lobby. So this time, I'm gonna turn things over to Professor Ben Bromley, also of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, who's gonna introduce our two speakers in the lecture tonight. Ben? Thank you all very much. Thank you, Henry. Indeed. <laughs> I am honored to introduce our speakers, Dr. Gail Sosowski and Dr. Kyle Dawson, who will describe what we can learn about the universe by surveying stars and galaxies in the cosmos. Both of our speakers are professors in physics and astronomy here at the University of Utah. Gail Sosowski is an astronomer who earned her PhD from the University of Virginia. She held National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellowships at Ohio State and Johns Hopkins, and after being a research fellow at the Space Telescope Science Institute, she joined us here last year. Gail's research focuses on our galaxy, the Milky Way, with its 100 billion stars, including the Sun. She studies the motion and composition of these stars to trace the history of our galaxy. Her work reveals how elements like carbon and oxygen are made and shared among stars, providing the raw materials for life like us and possibly life that's not at all like us. To piece together our galaxy's history, Professor Sosowski works with high quality data from hundreds of thousands of stars. This is big data, or what astronomers call survey science. Gail uses the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the premier program of its kind, involving dozens of institutions and telescope observations of roughly a billion stars and galaxies. The U has been a part of the Sloan since 2008. Gail, who has been um, a Sloan Survey architect since 2011, is the spokesperson for the next phase of this international collaboration. Further recognition of Gail's excellence in research and scientific leadership came just last week when she received a prestigious Scilog Award from the Research Corporation for Scientific Advancement. Gail, um, I want to extend my congratulations to you for this accomplishment. Kyle Dawson also does survey science. He received his PhD from Berkeley and arrived here nine years ago from a postdoctoral position at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Kyle has been playing leading key roles in several major survey science programs, including EBOS, a main Sloan Digital Sky Survey effort, which he leads as the principal investigator. By mapping huge numbers of galaxies like the Milky Way that are spread across the universe, Kyle works to deduce how the universe as a whole is evolving. EBOS is not only a cool name, it's cutting edge science. 10 years ago, research like this did not take place here in Utah. Today, thanks to Kyle and Gail's leadership, Utah is becoming a powerhouse in survey science. For example, here on our campus, just two buildings over there, 
The Digital Sky Survey, um, Sloan Digital Sky Survey data are managed and delivered to scientists all over the world. Now Kyle was the first astronomer hired by the university and Gail was uh, hired most recently. Thus, they sort of bracket our astronomy program's amazing nine-year existence. And what they study brackets a wide range of length scales. Gail focuses on things that are really, really big, while Kyle studies things that are really, really, well, so big I can't even imagine. So fortunately, I don't have to, because we have Gail and Kyle here to give us their insight. So please join me in welcoming Gail Zasowski and Kyle Dawson. Welcome everyone, thanks for coming out. Uh, so tonight we're gonna to be talking about astronomical data. Uh, what kinds of data astronomers actually use to explore the, the, um, the heavens, uh, how that data has changed over the centuries, how we actually use that data to get the answers that we're looking for, uh, and importantly, why we need so darn much of it. And we're gonna start appropriately enough with the night sky. So this is the dark-ish sky that most of us see at night if we live in Salt Lake City or in any of the suburbs uh, nearby. The average human can see about 300 stars um, uh, in the, in, under these kinds of conditions, fewer if you have more light pollution. But for most of human history, we haven't had to deal with light pollution or bright lights at night. So for most of human history, this is what the night sky has looked like. And nowadays, you can pretty much only see these kinds of conditions if you're out in the mountains somewhere, or out in the middle of the ocean, away from cities, away from highways, away from bright lights. Uh, under these conditions, the average human can see about 10,000 stars with the naked eye. Uh, about half of that, of course, about 5,000 at any one given time. Um, humans have been observing the night sky, using the observations we have of the night sky for all of recorded history and presumably before then, um, doing things like knowing when to plant their crops and harvest their crops, tracking the changing of the seasons, predicting eclipses and so on. Um, and it wasn't until about the second century BC that we had sort of systematic attempts to catalog the night sky. So one of the first, if not the first, catalog of stellar positions and brightnesses came, comes down to us from Hipparchus, who was a Greek astronomer and mathematician uh, who, lived in the seventh, who lived in the second century BC. Uh, he drew on earlier methods that had been developed largely by Middle Eastern astronomers uh, to compile a list of stars, less than a thousand stars, uh, their positions in the sky as precisely as he could measure them, and their relative brightnesses, uh, as he gauged just by looking at them with his eyes. Uh, this list was expanded and modified over the centuries, but all of them had the fundamental limitation of that they were the only stars that could appear are those that we can see with the naked eye under dark conditions. In the 17th century, though, with the invention of the telescope, that all changed. So Lippershey, uh, Galileo, Newton, these people invented, refined the telescope uh, and turned it to the sky. I don't know how different that looks to you, it looks very different on my screen, but with a, even with a small telescope, or actually even really good binoculars nowadays, uh, you can see about 300,000 stars in the sky. And the fainter you go, the more and more stars that appear. Um, the idea that there were things out there that we couldn't see with the naked eye, but that existed, and then the ability to actually measure them and to and have them look bigger and brighter to us really fundamentally changed the ways in which people did research on the sky, the ways in which they could ask questions of and analyze the sky. A couple of real quick examples of that. Uh, so William and Caroline Herschel were a brother and sister team uh, from Germany originally, worked in England, and they used a large number of uh, home-built telescopes in their backyard, which is how astronomy was generally done uh, back then, um, to discover and study a huge number of things, uh, comets and galaxies and the planet Uranus, uh, for one. Uh, but one of the cool things that I think that they did is they actually used some of the much longer catalogs of stars that we had to try to make a map of the Milky Way galaxy. They didn't know that the Milky Way was a galaxy then, we didn't know what galaxies were, but they tried to make a map of the distribution of stars around us. And that's what this is shown here um, from 1785. Fun fact, this is the oldest uh, citation that I had in my thesis, which my advisor was very proud of. Um, they got some things right, they got most things wrong. Um, we won't go into what, to what these are, this is the sun here in the middle. Uh, but this is a really impressive feat um, very early on in our scientific exploration of our place in the universe, and it benefited immensely from having, um, from having telescopes. 
Galaxies as well, not point sources, but now these large distributions of light in the sky, uh, also became more visible. Uh, they weren't called galaxies then, we called them spiral nebulae. Um, but our study of galaxies was restricted to drawings of what the astronomers saw through the telescope. We didn't have any, any way at this time to permanently record uh, what, what that astronomer saw. So this is an example of uh, the Earl of Ross in, uh, in Ireland made several drawings of galaxies uh, using observations with his telescope, which was called the Leviathan of Parsons Town, which is a phenomenal name for a telescope. Um, but he used the Leviathan to observe galaxies and then draw what he saw. This is an example of one of his drawings of M51, which is the Whirlpool Galaxy. This is a modern day Hubble Space Telescope image of the same galaxy. So he did a really good job, he got most of it right, but you can imagine it's hard to do sort of careful, systematic, scientific observations when all you have to go on are drawings of what someone saw on one particular night under some particular sky conditions. Uh, fast forward a few more decades, and now we have the ability to actually record data, permanently or semi-permanently, -permanent, in a way that other astronomers can independently analyze. And this really changes the kinds of things that you can do. Um, for the, in these early days, this basically relied on uh, photographic film technology uh, attached to the back end of ever larger telescopes. So this is the 100-inch Hooker Telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory, just outside of Los Angeles. Um, if you're ever in Los Angeles, Mount Wilson is a great place to go visit. They have all kinds of tours of historic telescopes. And this was the main instrument that uh, Edwin Hubble and his team used to discover the expansion of the universe in the 1920s, arguably one of the most fundamental discoveries uh, in our scientific history. And he used data taken with this telescope to show that if you looked at galaxies that were further and further away, so this is distance down here uh, and speed up here, as you looked at galaxies further and further away, you saw that they were moving away from us faster and faster and faster. And Kyle's gonna talk about how we actually use these kinds of data to measure the speeds of galaxies. But I just wanna point out that he did this using a sample size of a few dozen <coughs> galaxies. There's 32 points in this plot. So as we talk about the numbers of things that we're looking at uh, later on, just remember the number 30, 32 for this uh, transformational discovery. And of course, now we have a much wider range of telescope technology to work with. Uh, here are some examples. Um, we still have telescopes that work in the optical under very similar principles as those that Galileo and Newton used. We also have telescopes that are extraordinarily large. We have telescopes that are networked together across the entire planet. We have telescopes that are in space. Uh, we have telescopes that can measure optical light, but also that can measure radio light, X-rays, infrared light, gamma rays. And what this means is that we can gather data for huge numbers of objects, but also start getting at very different kinds of information about these objects. Here's an example of large numbers. So this is showing roughly the numbers of stars we have taken data for as a function of time, where now here is this dashed line. And the number of stars we have taken data for as a function of time roughly obeys um, a form of Moore's law. So this is just the, um, the behavior and in the, in the sense of the increase in computing power over time. Uh, and the important thing is that, so the, the line's going up to the right, so we're getting data on more and more objects. Um, the sequence here at the top, these are stars for which we have taken pictures of. Down here on the bottom, these are stars for which we have spectra of, which Kyle will talk about spectroscopy uh, in a minute. Um, but the important thing is that this is, we're moving from an era of just counting numbers of objects in a part of the sky into an era where we're asking really complicated questions of what those objects are like. And you can kind of think of it as the evolution from doing a simple census where you're saying how many people live in a house into an era where you know not only how many people there are, but what their Netflix browsing history looks like, what their shopping habits are, what their location data on their phone tells you, uh, which for better or for worse, uh, gives you a much fuller picture of what life is like in that house. Um, and so now we're moving into an era where we're not just you know, counting stars or counting galaxies, but we're learning things about those systems that give us a much fuller picture um, of what's happening in the universe around us. Okay, so as Gail introduced, the, you know, the background, what you saw is a lot of the earlier observations started by observations of stars, things that are within the galaxy. So here it's good to see where, we, where those are with respect to the, all the scales that are out there. It also jives with the introduction Ben gave with its different scales that I observe relative to what Gail observes. So a really simple breakdown is to look at the physics across the entire universe, across three distinct fields. The first would be the cosmological scales, that's the field I work in. Here we see the cosmology, we'll show simulations of each of these in a second, but if you look at the typical unit we use, we would say a light year is a unit where 
That's the distance light travels in one year. I think many people are familiar with that. If I look at this structure, I see uh, clouds of objects, veins, voids, a very sophisticated structure, and the scale across here is roughly 1.2 billion light years across this image. So that's the extreme category of cosmology. As you step down to wanting to understand not just the entire cosmos, but the how the galaxies form and what their environments are where galaxies form and the birth of galaxies, now you're talking about things that are in tens of millions of light years. Okay, so all of the universe, galaxy formation, and the next stage would be now towards those stars that we were seeing. This is a simulation we'll see shortly of uh, individual star formation. Now we're talking about molecular clouds that are on the order of light months across. So it gives you an idea of the range. Now, as you go from cosmology to galaxy to Milky Way scales, all of these are linked by common laws of gravity and electricity and magnetism. And what we do is we use computer simulations to try to understand the complex, phys the complex physics at hand, uh, because a lot of this can't be uh, modeled analytically with formulas and equations. Um, and when you run these computer simulations, what you find is that the processes are so complex that you really do need to have massive and massive amounts of data. So let's start by looking at a computer simulation on cosmological scales. And again, to set the stage, this is very similar to what I showed previously. This bar right here is 150 million light years across. So this whole box is something like 500 million light years. And we start from a, sorry, from a very early time in the universe, just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And what we see is the matter distribution, all presented in purple. And due to the laws of gravity, you start to see that original cloud-like structure form into the veins and filaments we saw on the previous slide. And this is almost 14 billion years of cosmic evolution. And what we want to do is capture snapshots of this because we can't observe the full time range of this. You can't watch for 14 billion years to watch the structure form. What you do instead is as you look out, the further out you see in the galaxy, or the, the universe, the further back in time you're effectively looking because it takes a finite amount of time for that light to reach you. Okay. Now, if we look at the complexity of the structure, now we zoom out even further. Now we're talking about something that's about 5 billion light years across from here to here. If I look on this scale, everything kind of looks uniform and the same. But when I look at, when I zoom in, sorry, it's getting used to the screen, the mouse here. When I zoom in, as I get finer and finer and finer scales, I start to resolve that structure. So I'm building an experiment. I want to be able to cover this full dynamic range so I can see what the physics are across this full uh, 1 billion light year volume box. Okay. Here we see structure now down at a mega or a few million light years, and that's going to be more like a galaxy cluster at the very end of that simulation. And here's a simulation of one of those galaxy clusters. So this is showing four different views of the same object. Uh, in the upper left, we have the starlight, so what your, what your eyes would see if you could just look at this. In the upper right is the, um, the density of the gas, how much gas you have between the stars outside the galaxy. Uh, the lower left is the temperature of the gas. And then the lower right is the chemical enrichment, or how many heavy elements, what fraction of heavy elements you have in the gas. And we start playing the movie. Um, you know, we see the galaxies are moving, but we also see a lot of really complicated things happening out here. All these different properties of the system are changing and evolving and interacting with each other in uh, subtle and not so subtle ways. You can see the massive bubbles being blown by the supernovae um, out into the universe. Um, and all of these things are altering the gas um, that's going to be formed into later generations of stars. Um, and physics is happening here on a variety of scales. We zoom in still further. Uh, we're not talking about things on the scales of solar systems. So when I start this movie, the, oh, there we go. So now we're looking at a single cloud. This is roughly the size of the outer part of our solar system out to the, out to the inner Oort cloud. We're going to zoom in. And now we're seeing things like stars forming. These very, so the, here the, the, um, the color shading is just the density of the material. So where you have white or yellow, this is very dense material. So you've got stars forming. 
they're colliding with each other, they're merging, you've got plumes of gas being flung out uh, due to the interactions of the system, you've got disks around the stars forming, these are the disks that planets may form out of. Sometimes the disks get disrupted and then they get reformed. These white dots being flung out are called brown dwarfs. They're uh, basically super, super, super giant planets that aren't quite big enough to be stars, um, but they get made and then they get flung out into space. I think we just recenter on this. I just finished letting this run out. But, um, but what this is showing is that even on very small scales and over relatively short time periods, this is just a few million years, uh, which to astronomers is pretty much the blink of an eye, you've got really complicated physics going on and some um, chaotic physics going on. So you need a lot of, a lot of data to actually constrain uh, what's going on on uh, a variety of timescales and a variety of, uh, of sizes. Okay, so now that you've seen each of those th three regimes of numerical simulation, let's just revisit the slide I showed to introduce this. Again, we have where we're talking about billions of light years. The physics we're typically exploring is like the laws of gravity and the expansion and history of the universe. What's the, what are the global properties of the universe? And then on the smallest scales, it's how, uh, what are the physics that lead to star formation, a lot of gas physics, and feedback from other stars, so a lot of very complex processes. Now, what we see between the two extremes is a factor of 10 billion in dynamic range. So it's a factor of 10 billion bigger on the left than it is on the right. Um, we can't do everything at once in the computer simulations. As we saw, the largest cosmology was just gravity. The smallest scale had a lot of gas physics at play. At the same time, not only can you not you know, do everything in the computer simulations, it's also limited by experimental design when you actually go out and collect data. It's very hard to do all these things, you know, to study all these physics in one observation. So what we really want in each of these regimes is to collect massive amounts of data to really probe the full range of possibilities for these different, uh, these, the different formation scenarios. So can we actually build an experiment that can do all these at once? Now, back in the 90s, there was a desire to build experiments to grow the size of samples, but it really did not try to do all these at once. It really focused primarily on galaxies and look as a probe of cosmology, looking at the larger scales. So if you look at the earliest programs in the 70s, 80s, up to 1994, there was two real leads in the surveys out there, and they basically took like 20 years between the two of them to collect about 50,000 objects. So what they did is they used spectroscopy, which I'll explain shortly, to measure the distances to galaxies and construct a three-dimensional map. If I look at a pure, just a snapshot of the sky with a camera, like you would with your digital camera on a telescope, what you see is a two-dimensional image of where things are on the sky in their x and y position. But that's not enough to resolve a three-dimensional map. Spectroscopy gives you that third coordinate from which you can measure a three-dimensional map. You take this map at different snapshots, and you map it on those computer simulations I showed before, and you can really see the way in which the voids and the filaments and the, the clusters form over all of cosmic time. And that's what these first projects were doing. And what you see, even when you only have a thousand galaxies from the sur CFA survey in 1985, you can start seeing very similar structure in the distribution of galaxies to what we saw in those numerical simulations. You see a big void, you see filaments, you see a big cluster, this is exactly as predicted, but it's not yet on large enough scales to, to really probe cosmology. So when we saw these, it demanded more and more observations, more and more data. We wanted to answer questions like, how universal is the structure we see here? Is this just one snapshot of one particular region of the universe? What happens when I go further and further out and, 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 and sample the full extent of the universe? And likely, how, long, how far out do you need to go before things become really uniform and smooth? They start looking the same everywhere. These are fundamental cosmology questions. As you also notice, this is now diverging from, the from what we showed earlier, where we're only talking about galaxies and cosmology. What about all the stars? There's 100 billion stars in our galaxy. And the early surveys mentioned here didn't actually make any attempt to explore the stars. So the first survey that really wanted to scale up massively from the previous work is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It was proposed in, like, in roughly 1990, and it started collecting data in the year 2000. And if you look at the original motivation, the, the proposal is still online for this project, it's really simple. 
It just says, we want to collect as much data as possible. We want to build a telescope to do that. That would never fly on any project today. You really have to go out of your way to characterize every, you have to justify every photon you count. And it's a lot of work. But back then, this, justified, this was sufficient to justify the experiment. And if you really look more precisely what they proposed, it was to take images of as much of the sky as possible, just like your digital camera taking snapshots of the sky, and to observe as many galaxies and quasars as possible. And there I mean by spectroscopy, which I'll come back to in a second. If I look at the whole footprint in the sky, this is roughly a quarter of what you can see from the entire Earth. This is, entire, this is a quarter of the, the surface of the sky is what we covered in, in Sloan. If I look at the imaging data, okay, there's 230 million objects across that catalog that we took pictures of and we identified specifically, 230 million. If we look at the spectroscopic program, remember there was like 50,000 objects and it took like two decades to collect them from the previous pro projects. Now we have almost a million galaxies we have a quarter million stars and 100,000 quasars, so well over a million objects, so scaling by a factor of 20 of what was done in the two decades previously. It's a massive improvement in size, and this project was completed in about five years. You can see the time scale here in the bottom corner of the years 2000 to 2005. So what enabled this was to really dedicate an entire facility to the survey itself, and this had actually never been done before. Everything else been done in a single night allocated here, a single night there, a telescope here, a telescope there. No one actually built a telescope and the instruments with the idea of just doing, just surveying everything. The telescope that they built is two and a half meters in diameter. It's located in New Mexico. It looks like this. It sits inside this box as a baffle for, for light. And when you open the petals, you can expose to the sky. So the mirror is sitting back here for this telescope. It's sitting in southern New Mexico at Apache Point Observatory. The telescope is right here on the map. If I look south, I get to El Paso. Uh, Las Cruces is a little bit to the southwest. Uh, it's about a two-hour drive from El Paso. The other really key ingredient was not just dedicating the instrument but also having a dedicated collaboration. This was not now two or three people looking, you know, taking pictures of the sky in a given night. It's now a large, large collaboration with institutions from all around the world. This is an image we took from our collaboration meeting in Paris. There's roughly 150 people here. That's about a third of the entire project. So we're now talking about roughly 500 people working together on the experiment. Those 500 people are distributed all over the world. You know, there's something like 50 institutions that are members of the current project, and they cover all the, you know, they cover four continents, Asia, Europe, South America, and North America. Okay. Here you see Gail posing with what I'll show, talk about in a second, is an aluminum plate that we use to perform spectroscopy. Uh, this is Sten, right, who I have not actually met yet, but he will be arriving here shortly as a new postdoc. He's an NSF postdoctoral fellow. And I'm looking forward to meeting him shortly as he's giving one of our earliest <laughs> seminars. Okay, so when we talk about a dedicated telescope, there's a lot more than just having a piece of glass sitting behind a dome. You actually need to have an instrument, as Gail mentioned, to collect photons and allow us to interpret those photons. So there's two specific instruments we built on the Sloan Telescope. The, f the first did imaging, which is literally just taking pictures of the sky. To give you an idea of the scale of this, here is the digital camera that sits behind the telescope. It's roughly the size of a human being. So it's roughly a meter across. This is Jim Gunn, who's a professor at Princeton. He was one of the main architects. This takes images just as your digital camera would, except instead of just doing it in three filters, R, G, and B, it takes it in five filters. And you actually kind of see the color of reflected lights off of the filters. That really does represent the images, you know, the, the, it, the color of the light that each of those detectors is sensitive to. Now let's see in terms of scale, if you have a cell phone, it has maybe a few million pixels in it for your camera, your cell phone camera. If you get a really nice digital camera, uh, off for, that's an a, 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 a SLR camera, it's maybe 20 million pixels 
Okay, that's about the high-end camera you can buy right now. This is about 120 million pixels in this detector, and that was built in 1999. Okay. So really ahead of its time. And because you have these five filters, you can reconstruct the sky in real life color. And that's what you see here is a stripe of imaging from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And you can see galaxies that are more yellowish in appearance, more reddish in appearance, more bluish in appearance. And that's due to the multi-filters in the imaging. Okay. So it's very, it should be very similar to what you expect from your, your intuition of taking a, a picture. Spectroscopy is a little less intuitive, but it's something we've seen many, many times in our life. Spectroscopy is simply the tool of taking light from an object and dispersing it through some optic so that you can see the amount of light at each wavelength. What we see this all the time is in a rainstorm, when a rainbow appears, the droplets of rain are acting as an optical component and separating the light into red, green, blue, you know, Roy G. Biv. Okay? A prism, same idea, you take in white light and it disperses it into red, yellow, green, blue, and so on and so forth. So we have exactly this component in our instrument, we call it the spectrograph, and what it allows us to do is take the light from the objects that we know exist from those previous imaging data and isolate each object we want to observe, put the light down a fiber optic, and send it into the dispersive element so we get an image. And the image now is broken down into flux as a function of wavelength. This is a classic spectrum of a galaxy. On the y-axis is the brightness, on the x-axis is the, ra the wavelength. Here you have red or light, just like you would the, the rainbow, the red side, this is the blue side. These really translate to true color. And if I'm looking, I can identify distinct elements in the spectrum. I can see oxygen, I can see hydrogen, I can see more oxygen, I can see magnesium, sodium. These are lines that are emanating from the galaxy we're observing itself and we know by physics how those lines are created and we can start deducing the properties of the galaxy from those. Now, I'm gonna come back to this, but a key ingredient in how do we get the light into the spectrograph is an aluminum plate. So this is an aluminum plate that literally sits at the bottom of that arrow. You see focal plane up there and the arrow pointing to the cartridge. This sits in that cartridge, the cartridge weighs about 400 pounds, and that whole system is meant to simply support this object. And then a human being plugs a fiber optic into every hole. What, afterwards, you'll be able to see this, after the talk, you'll be able to see this plate up close. You'll see there's a thousand holes in here, and they correspond to the positions where the telescope is going to focus the light on each of the thousand objects I want to observe. And for each of those thousand objects, I get a spectrum. So where do those thousand objects come from? I have to sift through the imaging data. And based on how red or green or blue or yellow an object appears, and based on its morphology, I decide whether or not I want to observe it for a spectrum. There's 250 million objects in here. We could, select, we could observe spectroscopy about a couple million objects over 10 years. So we have to be very selective in which objects we choose. These coordinates, bang, 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 of all these objects really do correspond to the coordinates on this aluminum plate. It's exactly where the telescope will focus them. Here I have the objects we selected for my cosmology program. These are galaxies we wanted to observe to explore the expansion of the universe. And you can see we're really only selecting a very small sample of the available objects. Okay. Once we have our sample of objects, we have to produce one aluminum plate for every thousand objects, and we're observing two million. So we've drilled thousands of these aluminum plates. For every plate, a human being has to go in and put a fiber optic into every hole in every plate. And this is what the process looks like. So it's not sped up as much as you might think. They're pretty good at this. <laughs> so when I do this, it probably would take me about four hours to do a plate when, uh, that's probably Diana Holder, who's been working for the observatory more than anyone else, longer than anyone else, she can do it in about half an hour to 45 minutes. And there was one month where we did 110 plates just for my project alone. 
So that's you know, 110,000 fibers by just a few handful of people in a month. And they've done millions. Okay. And again, this is the scale of the plate that we're talking about, just to put that uh, image into perspective, that video into perspective. Okay. So they're full-time employees. This is most of their job. <laughs> and I was always worried about carpal tunnel syndrome. And if you notice, when they do this, they plug, I thought it, they plug downward. They plug it in this way. What their, their original design was, was the whole thing was flipped upside down, and they plugged it in like this. And what it turned out is that this, all the pluggers within a month had carpal tunnel. <laughs> and tend to, tend to night, they had all kinds of problems with their wrists. So all they did was flip it over, change the angle in which you put the fibers in, and no one's had a problem ever since. And Diana, again, the same person, she quit her jo previous job as a, as a di dental hygienist because of carpal tunnel. So this is far preferable for her. <laughs> okay, so once we have a fiber in each hole, we take we can do eight cartridges or eight, nine cartridges a night, nine plates in a night. They have to be plugged during the day. We move one at a time to the telescope and observe. When it's sitting on the telescope, for my program, we observe for roughly an hour, just letting the telescope focus light and send it down each of those thousand fibers into the spectrograph. And after you observe for an hour, you get data that we can interpret. Okay? These are galaxies, very, very classic galaxy spectra. I can identify features similar to what I showed in the previous slide. I can see calcium features in here. I can see an oxygen feature here. And by identifying those features and how they move from one object to another object, to another object, to another object, I'm focusing on the calcium H and K features. Boom, 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 boom. Notice how they move to longer and longer wavelengths. That's because that galaxy in each of those spectra is further and further away. This galaxy here is further away from this galaxy. What I've characterized the distance here is we use a unit called redshift, which tells me what's the fractional change in that wavelength. But if I convert it to a cosmological model, the light, the photons that got sent down that fiber were traveling for 5.9 billion years before we caught them. For this object, those photons were traveling through the universe unhindered for 6.7 billion years before they wound up in our spectrograph. Okay, 7.1 billion years, 7.9 billion years. So we really are seeing further and further back in the time or further and further back in distance and we can measure that distance with these spectra and that's how we do this. So once we collect many, many objects, we can make a three-dimensional map of the universe. We had the X and Y positions based on the imaging, and now we're getting the third coordinate with the spectrum. This is a slice from my last project called the Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey. Uh, this was a very big project that ran from 2009 to 2014. And what you see is a slice of that three-dimensional map of galaxies. This again, shows us the clustering, the voids, the filaments, a lot of the same structure we saw in the numerical simulations. What we want to do is not just look at this conceptually, but we collapse it into statistics that allow us to compare to very specific cosmological models. I'm not going to go into detail there, but the bottom line is these figures show those statistics. And the biggest discovery in terms of cosmology from the first Sloan survey is that you could actually use this technique to find the same structure imprinted only, only 300,000 years after the Big Bang in what was called the cosmic background. You could see that same structure imprinted in the distribution of galaxies tens of, you know, roughly 10 billion years later. That's a, quite a phenomenal discovery. Our cosmological models able to map something from a very early time in the universe all the way across the ruler of all cosmic time to today and really connect these two through the same physics. And to look at what we actually see, again, I'm not going to go into the mathematics, but it's roughly speaking the same wiggles here in this figure. They characterize the pattern of spots and dark spots in the cosmic background. Those same wiggles appear in the distribution of galaxies. They're imprinted for all of time and we're able to observe them. So I would say that was probably the biggest discovery from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the first generation. We knew they would be there in the galaxy distribution, that, the, that signature. We didn't know we could actually ever see it. Okay. 
Another classic example of what we learned from the first Sloan Jewel Sky Survey was how far back in time objects are forming. So for five times over, the Sloan Jewel Sky Survey set the record for the most distant quasar ever observed. So as they kept collecting more and more data, they kept finding more and more of these rare objects further, further out into time. Now, what does it actually look like? First, a quasar is a supermassive black hole. This is an artist's rendition. This is not what we can actually see. But it's a supermassive black hole, and it's accreting you know, roughly a solar mass of material every year. So basically, it's collapsing the sun into the, it's sucking a, a, a sun into, the, into its black hole every year. And I'm gonna come back to this. We're gonna see this a couple times throughout the talk. But it, as it devours all that material, it glows. And this is the most luminous object that can exist in the universe. When you look really back in far in time, it does not look very luminous. Here, the arrow is pointing this tiny little faint dot, which is a quasar where the light was emitted. Um, how far away was this? <laughs> Uh, we took it off the slide. Right, okay, it's right of 6.43. That's probably something like 12 and a half billion years ago. So it took like 12 and a half billion years for light to reach us from this particular object. Okay. And people were inspired based on the properties they saw in this tiny little dot to follow it up, get a spectrum, and here's what the spectra look like. This is the most, this at the time was the most furthest object known in the universe. And we can deduce the distance by the feature of hydrogen called Lyman alpha. And you can see this sharp feature right here is a well-known physical phenomenon. And that's how we deduce the distance to that quasar. But it's amazing that you could go from an image here where there's very limited information to a spectrum here where you get a real grasp on what you're really looking at. And that's one of the most powerful things about this project is it was the first thing to be able to combine the imaging to the spectroscopy. So what I showed in those last couple of slides, for the most part, was trying to highlight the discoveries of the first Sloan Digital Sky Survey. That was the years 2000, 2005. So where are we right now? So what's the current state of the art? So as Ben mentioned, the, one of the components of the current Sloan Digital Sky Survey is called EBOS. It's, it's uh, a, another cosmology project. It's for, for, as I'll show in this, or actually I'll show on this slide, it really is by far the leading cosmology program in the world right now, definitely for spectroscopy and arguably for anything else uh, in terms of making an impact on the cosmological model. I'm the PI of the project. Um, it's running, as it combines with BOSS, over a 10 year period. And in that 10 years, we're gonna survey the universe from a period of today to a period roughly 12 billion years ago. We're gonna make a full three dimensional map over that whole epic of cosmic history. And this amount of sky coverage is roughly a quarter of what's visible on the, on the entire sky. Some of the first measurements that we've made from the current sample, and this is in 2016, um, this, is the most, this is the most cutting edge. Here is that same wiggle pattern we saw on the previous slide appearing in a new distribution of galaxies. We're now building, now that we've shown we can make this measurement, we're now building and dedicating entire programs to measure this on a, on a systematic level. Here is the same pattern, very hard to see. This is starting to, see, we're pushing the limit of the observatory. Uh, that's in quasars, and that's the most distant um, sample of direct objects we've ever used to make this measurement. Now to put it into perspective in terms of other cosmology measurements, here we have all the data over cosmic time that we've collected in the red and the green. This is our program. Again, this covers the time from today here on the left side of the axis to a time roughly 12 billion years ago on the right hand side. And if you look at our data on the red and the green, it really dominates all the information we have about this range of cosmic history. The blue is everyone else. So you can really see a, a, a huge contrast. And again, this is because we're really the only dedicated program out there that's capable of doing this at this scale. So while BOSS and EBOSS were built specifically to measure the properties of galaxy clustering and, and cosmology over as much cosmic history as possible, a lot of other stuff comes out of, a lot of other information comes out of the data. I would say the most surprising thing we've discovered in this program is what's called a changing look quasar. So I'm coming back to this whole idea of a quasar again. Remember the quasar is something, it's an object of like 
you know, 100 billion solar masses, it's a black hole, and it's devouring its surroundings at something like a solar mass per year. It's a massive amount of energy, it's a massive amount of mass, it's a massive amount of luminosity, all in one shot. And what we've seen, when now that we have a long baseline between SDSS and EBOS, we've observed quasars back 10, 15 years ago. We've seen all the classic properties, we've seen broad emission lines, we've seen very classic quasar spectra, and we've seen them completely turn off. That massive system of accretion, we've seen completely turn off and leave nothing behind. So here's some, the same object observed 10 years later, and the quasar is gone, and what you see is the galaxy only that was hosting that quasar. So we know this is not a, an artifact because we can actually see the same galaxy hidden underneath all that light, but all the quasar emission is gone. So this is, I would say, the biggest discovery from the newest sample, and that's going to lead into the next generation of Sloan as well. It's going to be part of the motivation for Sloan 5. So. Okay, so uh, we're going to zoom in a little bit and closer to home. Uh, so Kyle uses quasars and galaxies to study the universe very, very far away. Uh, I look at things a little bit more in our backyard. So I, I'm interested in things in the Milky Way galaxy and in nearby galaxies, the stars, the gas, and the dust. Uh, questions like, when and where did the stars form that we can see in the night sky? Uh, where and when did the heavy elements form and how did they get into the stars? Uh, when we look out in the Milky Way, which this is a picture um, from the, um, the recent data re released from the Gaia satellite, we see a lot of really complicated structure. Um, you know, how do the, so when we look out in the galaxy, we see a lot of stars that are mixed together. We see a lot of complicated relationships and correlations between different properties of the stars. Um, you know, how are those uh, reflected in the light coming from other galaxies where we can't resolve that kind of complexity? And then how can we use the fact that we can see the Milky Way so well to help us interpret light coming from those other galaxies? Um, the Milky Way is the only large galaxy that we can actually measure large numbers of individual stars in. Um, for various reasons we don't have time to get into right now, it's only been recently that we could actually do that. We had the technology to actually make those measurements. Um, but we do have it now, and Sloan is doing it now, SDSS is doing it now, uh, and that's the main project that I work on. It's called, it's called Apogee. And one of the hottest questions that people are asking now is where do the elements in the periodic table come from? So hopefully people are familiar with this from high school chemistry. Uh, anyone's having a panic attack over seeing this from high school chemistry. Um, the vast majority of the, uh, so uh, we know that all of the hydrogen and the helium in the universe largely was made during the Big Bang. Very early on, has kind of stuck around for the last 13.8 billion years since then. And we know in broad brush, and we knew in broad brush uh, up to several years ago, that most of the other elements in the periodic table were made in stars of some form or flavor of another. Um, you know, Carl Sagan said that we are, we are made of star stuff, and this is what he means, is that all of the atoms in our bodies uh, that are not hydrogen and helium, you know, all of the oxygen atoms and all of the water molecules in our body were made in a star billions of years ago, not the sun. Um, and so understanding how these elements were formed, where they were formed, uh, tells us a lot uh, about where life in the galaxy may have arisen, what kinds of planets can form around different kinds of stars and so on. It's made a little complicated by the fact that most of the universe turns out to be hydrogen and helium. So the two of those alone make up about 98% of the elemental matter in the universe, uh, which leaves only 2% for everything else. But uh, that 2% is where most of the interesting stuff happens. So all of the chemistry and all the physical processes that require things that have you know, more than two protons uh, are in this purple box down here at the bottom. Um, and this governs everything from how galaxies can evolve to how human beings can live out our lives, if human beings can live out our lives. Because it turns out that human beings actually have a very different ratio of these heavy elements um, than the universe does as a whole. So we have a lot more carbon, nitrogen, uh, and oxygen than some random chunk um, of, uh, of dark space. So, so being able to trace down the origins of these elements um, uh, is, is, is really important for questions of life and for, for the chemistry of the universe as a whole. And stars provide some of the best, best tracers of this chemical history. So Kyle was showing some spectra of galaxies earlier. Uh, these are spectra of light added up from millions or hundreds of millions or billions of stars all summed up together. Here, these are spectra now of individual stars where the color on top shows the features, the little bumps and wiggles that are due to some of the most common elements in the human body. So green here are carbon, are wiggles due to carbon in the star. Orange are wiggles due to uh, hydrogen of a certain temperature. Um, purple here is nitrogen. 
And so I work on, on projects that use the spectra of the individual stars to measure what is the heavy element ratios in these stars. And what this tells us is what the heavy elements were like when the star was formed, sometime between now and 13.8 billion years ago, uh, at the spot in the galaxy where the star formed. And then how can we use this information to trace back what the chemical history is? And so using, and so once, oh yeah, I wanted to say, point out. And so underneath this, the spectra, uh, so the picture here, this is an artist's drawing of a galaxy kind of like the Milky Way, roughly to scale. And the blue points show the distribution of stars that we can make these measurements in. So it's not a complete map, but we're able to actually measure, you know, what is the nitrogen to oxygen to sulfur ratios for stars. So the sun is here. For, and we can actually make these measurements for stars that are most of the way across the galaxy. And once we can do that, once we can map out where the elements lie, we can see what kinds of stars have certain kinds of ratios in them, how much variation do you have in these ratios of different parts in the galaxy, uh, what else is happening nearby that could have been polluting the stars. Then we can start piecing together how the elements are made and really nailing down the details of that broad brush picture, which we can show by coloring in the periodic table. And I think this is absolutely gorgeous. This is the culmination of literally decades of work um, by tons of people. This appeared in uh, uh, American Scientist uh, earlier this month um, by, someone, by uh, one of my collaborators at Ohio State. Um, but basically it shows a periodic table where the color now of each element indicates the fraction of that element that we think is made with different physical mechanisms. So certain elements form together. So oxygen, sodium, magnesium, we think that these are formed almost entirely in exploding massive stars and supernovae. Uh, carbon and nitrogen here in yellow have large contributions from low mass stars like the sun. Okay, and so putting all these together, we can get a picture of where the elements in us came from, where the elements in planets came from, and are distributed throughout the galaxy. Of course, the other piece of the puzzle is the ages of the stars, or how old uh, the stars are. And this is a tricky problem. So uh, age dating stars is hard. Uh, age dating humans is easy by comparison. So if you, if you see another person just looking at them by eye, you can usually guesstimate their age plus or minus a few years. Okay? And the reason we can do this is because most humans uh, age similarly and at the same rate. This is not true for stars. So the stages of evolution that a star goes through and how long it spends in each of those stages depends very strongly, almost entirely, on how much mass it had when it was born. This is not something that's very easy to measure. Uh, generally, we don't know it for any given star. Um, for example, very, very massive stars. So this here is mass, size in this axis, and this is time. Very, very massive stars live a few million years, explode, and are gone. Okay. In contrast, very, very low mass stars, things much, much smaller than the sun, just kind of hang out, glowing faintly, still glowing faintly. Uh, these things have life expectancies many times the age of the current universe. Okay. Stars like the sun uh, will look like the sun for about 10 billion years. And there's very little information on where exactly in that 10 billion year span uh, any given star is. Um, so it's tricky to tell how old stars are, um, and I won't, I'm not going to show any, any, uh, any plots, but uh, the point is that when you have massive amounts of data, you can actually, and massive amounts of data, critically, taken with the same instrument and processed the same way. So you're getting rid of all the changes and differences and systematics that are due to different software pipelines. If you have that, a ton of data on these stars, you can actually begin to tease out some of the very subtle features in the spectra that do tell us things about the age. So patterns that are unnoticeable in small samples or in samples from different telescopes, but because we're able to do so many stars with SDSS, um, we can actually put age markers on stars. And so the result to show here is one of the very first age maps of the Milky Way galaxy. So the underlying picture here is a computer simulation of, of, of the Milky Way, and then overplotted are points for the stars for which we have reasonable age measurements where the color roughly indicates the age. Um, so there's a bunch of different models for how galaxies form, in particular galaxy disks, like the Milky Way has a big thin disk. Um, and they all make predictions for where stars of different ages should be based on how the galaxy grows over time. And so our observations show that you have the oldest stars are concentrated in the center, you have younger stars as you move further out. And so this, just this picture alone, basically rules out any galaxy formation model that doesn't start with the Milky Way, the, with the, the infant Milky Way as a very small blob of stars eight or 10 billion years ago that gradually grows by adding stars on uh, to the outside of its disk and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we call this inside out uh, galaxy formation. So this is one of the coolest results that's come out 
Um, and I think stellar astronomers 50 years ago would have been just absolutely floored that we could actually make these kinds of measurements. All right, so the data keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I'm going to wrap up with talking about the future. Uh, so Ben mentioned I'm the spokesperson for SDSS 5, the Sloan Digital Survey 5. Uh, this is the next generation of SDSS, uh, and it's going to be an entirely new beast. We are going to have two dedicated facilities, each of which with, set with uh, multiple telescopes, um, not only in New Mexico, uh, but also down here in Chile. And so this lets us do things over the entire sky, the entire Milky Way galaxy, um, and the entire um, uh, universe beyond it. We're going to be taking new spectra of hundreds of thousands of supermassive black holes uh, and galaxy clusters, uh, and this includes several of those changing look quasars um, that, uh, that Kyle was talking about, which are bizarre but super interesting um, for cosmology. We're going to be mapping regions of star formation uh, throughout the entire Milky Way galaxy and through several nearby galaxies. Uh, this relies on the fact that newborn stars light up the gas around them like a spotlight. Um, and so uh, remember the simulation that I showed earlier of the star forming and the disks around it and the brown dwarfs being flung off in all directions? This program is actually going to go, is going to go through and look at that uh, in real life, um, in real time. Not in real time, in real life. It's not that long. Um, the project that I'm most excited about, because stars, uh, is we're actually going to be taking spectra of 5 million stars in the Milky Way galaxy. There's still a tiny number of stars in the galaxy. Um, but the increase, but this is, a five, this is roughly a 10 time increase over what we have now. Um, and I'll show you why that's important. So Kyle mentioned earlier that in order to take spectra of objects, you have to sort of subsample from the things that you could take spectra of. So you have the image of galaxies, you pick out which small fraction of galaxies you want to look at. We have to do the same with stars in the Milky Way. So this is a gorgeous picture of um, the Milky Way taken over uh, Gran Escalante um, down, in, uh, down in, in the southern part of the state. And I'm going to overlay the positions of some of the stars that we have observed um, in my project. So the big circles here are the footprint of these big plates that Kyle was showing before. Um, these are big, actually. Each, each plate, if you were to hold it up, covers about six full moons across the sky. Right, so these are actually quite large. Um, so each big circle is a plate. The white dots inside each circle are the stars that we looked at in that patch of sky. Okay. Um, but there are thousands more stars in each circle that we didn't get a chance to look at. And um, that's not saying anything about all of the stars that are between the circles or the stars out here. Um, so why does this matter? Why is, why is this important? Well, let's say that we had two different models for what the Milky Way uh, looks like. Two different distributions of properties, say, chemical abundance. That, that was plausible. Okay. I'm going to use two famous American paintings here to represent these models. If we sample them uh, at roughly the same density that we have in our, in our stellar sample right now, these are the patterns that we see. Can anyone identify these two paintings? Hear mutterings, no one's bold enough to say it super loudly, all right. Um, we can see that they're different, but we may not have a good handle on what's actually happening. However, if we now sample it at the density that Sloan 5 is going to be sampling the galaxy, this is what we can see, okay. So with the coarser sampling, we could tell they were different. Um, if the Milky Way looks like the Rothko, then maybe the coarser sampling is okay. We can see sort of the underlying pattern. There's not a lot going on in certain broad brush that we're going to miss. However, everything that we are learning over the last several decades has pointed to the fact that the Milky Way is much more uh, like the, um, the Basquiat. Um, it's structure all the way down. And so when you're when you're doing the core sampling, you see that there's a lot of complexity, but there's a lot of substructure, a lot of patterns that you're just simply not going to be able to map when you're not looking at as many stars as you, as you possibly can. So this is why we really need to, uh, to push the envelope, to use, um, to take full advantage of all the new technology that we can, to make the sample sizes as large as we possibly can, um, to start exploring all of those you know, 20 new questions that spring up every time you answer one question. Um, a lot of the mysteries that we're addressing now couldn't even have been formulated as questions 100 years ago. And I think that's going to be equally true in 100 years. And so the reason that we're making these massive data sets uh, is simply to try to build up the toolkits um, so that when we are able to ask those questions, we have, um, we have the tools at hand. So thank you.
Um, now we'll have uh, uh, questions for our speakers. Please. Yep, so the question is, in the chart of a best understanding of where the elements come from, uh, oh, no, slow down. Two of them are not colored in. Uh, yeah, uh, technetium and it's not polonium. Does anyone know for an extra cookie? Wait. Promethium, wait. okay. Uh, the reason is that these do not have any stable isotopes. What is the other one? Promethium? Yes. Palladium? I don't know. So, complicated elements. Uh, the elements, the elements that are formed in massive stars, massive stars explode, they get dispersed and reform in other objects. What about the heavy elements that are formed in the single stars? Do they get locked there? Or how are they redistributed as they are? It's a great question. So the question is, uh, so the elements that are formed, um, many of these are formed in explosions, exploding massive stars and exploding white dwarfs. Those elements get dispersed, but what about the elements that form uh, in stable stars that don't explode? Uh, and you're right, and so, so stars like our sun that are never going to explode, all of the elements that are formed in the core, um, all the way up to carbon, uh, are gonna stay locked in that core forever. So as the sun, as the sun evolves, um, it's gonna get larger and larger and larger. The outer envelope of the star, which does contain some of the heavy elements that have gotten brought up from the core, that will drift off into space. And so some of those elements will get incorporated into later stars. But most of it that's locked in the core will stay locked in the core, uh, actually as a white dwarf star, so that's these. Um, and so white dwarfs that do eventually explode will disperse those elements, but if they don't explode, then yeah, they will sit there and they will cool and cool and cool and there's all that uh, you know, carbon, oxygen, neon, whatever it is that's lost to the universe forever, as it were. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the implication of the, the darkening quasar or whatever turning off? Okay, so the, the question is to ask, is asking for a little bit more detail about the implications for the changing of quasars. So the physical models for this actually are not well understood at all. We did not believe that accretion, you know, so there's a massive amount of accretion, as I mentioned before, right? You have an entire solar mass falling onto the black hole every year. Uh, so something more about the mass of the sun all dispersed through this big disk. And for physics, physical reasons we just don't understand yet, it just turns off. So from a physical impl implication, I would say this is just something that we did not expect to have happened. So this is just a pure surprise. So one of the things we're trying to do is understand exactly what would allow, what in the dynamics would allow that material to stop falling on the black hole. The, everything points, we've looked at other possible explanations like is it being shielded or some other thing, is, is there another cloud preventing us from seeing it? But all of the evidence points to the fact that it's just stopping, it's, uh, it's accretion is really almost turning off. And that's just something that's hard to, uh, to model. Um, the galaxy is probably something like 11, 10 to 11 times the size, mass of the sun. Yeah, it's something, it could be like a Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, this, and um, the black hole at the center of the galaxy is probably, you know, 100 million solar masses, something like that. Oh, uh, the black hole is tiny compared to the, the galaxy, actually. Uh, I mean, even when we're talking about such a massive black hole, the galaxy is even that much bigger. Down here. Oh, oh. You guys are getting with concepts that I have a little trouble with. <laughs> just Us too. Is so. that, as I understand it, at the time of the Big Bang, just 14 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was compressed into a speck smaller than the nucleus of matter. Is that how it was? So, so from a cosmology perspective, we typically don't like to talk about the size of the universe. We just typically talk, like to talk about the spacing between different points. So that space in between points is basically infinitely small. And then something happened, the Big Bang started. I, the way I look at it is the Big Bang happened, we don't know why. There was a period of inflation that ran from like 10 to the minus 34 to 10 to the minus 32 seconds, so it was just a tiny little sliver after the Big Bang. 
And that is really what set the, the, the physics of the universe in motion. So the way I really look at it is the initial conditions were set a little bit after the Big Bang, and that started the, the ball rolling. But I don't know why the Big Bang happened. Um, but we really don't characterize, we never try to characterize things in terms of the overall size of the universe. We always just talk about if an object is separated from another object by this much at this point in time, how does that separation between those two objects change as the universe grows? And, and that takes away everything, that, that's an independent measurement that takes in, 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 to, ignores the size of the universe. I'll continue to have problems with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and a lot of people do, actually. <laughs> it's very common. Yes. What happened, uh, what existed, what was the size before the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> <laughs> so, there's lots of ideas out there, but I, I'm, a really boring person, and I just rely on what we can see. So I don't even pretend to imagine what happens before the Big Bang. Maybe I just have a lack of imagination. I don't know. Well, it's not measurable. It's not measurable. So, so for me, it's it's. I mean, it, it's not the answer you want to hear, but for me, it's an irrelevant question. We had. Let's see. There was one question back there, and then I see a person over there. Uh, yes, the question was, um, how do stars form on the outside of the galaxy as opposed to the inside? So, so there's gas uh, well beyond what you can see in, quote unquote, the galaxy. If you remember the, the simulation early on that had, um, that had the, the galaxies that you could see in starlight, but then it also had the gas density and temperature. And so you have gas well up beyond where you can see the stars forming. And it's, it's that outer gas that's, that's going to collapse over time and form stars uh, later on. So if you look at the Milky Way, so I mean, we have the picture. So this is the starlight that you see of the Milky Way. Um, this is actually a 3D picture, sort of. So this is the center of the galaxy. And as you look along here, you're looking, if you were standing here, you sort of wrap around behind your head. Um, but there's gas that extends well beyond the edge of, um, of even the Milky Way's disk. And that was even truer very early on uh, in, the, in the universe. So there's a lot of gas that we can't see with our eyes. And that's what's collapsing to form stars. You had a question over there. Okay, so I forgot to repeat the previous questions, but this question is, um, when you're measuring the cosmic distance scales, one of the fundamental purposes is trying to measure how the universe is expanding over all of time and then deducing what's the underlying mechanisms. And the question is, how does our technique that I talked about today compare to the use of supernova, which really are what led to the true, under, you know, supernova and subject variables are really what led us to the real understanding of the cosmic expansion history. The Nobel Prize in 2011 went for the discovery of dark energy through supernova observations. And the idea of a supernova is that you kind of know how bright it is by, by its fundamental physics, and then you can deduce it's a, by its apparent brightness how far away it is. We call it a standard candle. So how does that compare to what we're doing? That first of all, the results I showed were exactly the same Hubble diagram that you would see for supernova. The supernova do better in the cosmic history of roughly today to something like six billion years ago uh, because you can collect a ton of them and we're limited in how much volume we can explore. So they're actually a better technique for that range of cosmic history than what we're doing. However, once you go to larger distances, supernova become really hard to discover. They become hard to observe. They become really faint. And our technique becomes very dominant. So overall, the, the power of ours, because it covers all of cosmic history, basically anytime you can see galaxies, you can make our measurement. It actually leads to much tighter measurements and tighter constraints that we can get out of supernova. But supernova preceded us, and they're the ones that won the Nobel Prize for this work. We would have won the Nobel Prize if no one had seen a supernova before. <laughs> this close. Yes. Uh, we detect the universe expanding, and we're talking about the stuff we can see. Do we also presume that dark matter has expanded in some way? OK, so the question is, as, this is a very subtle question. What we're observing is not matter. What we're observing is light from galaxies and quasars. And is that really mapping the same physics 
of dark matter and other things that we can't see. And this is actually one of the core questions we try to understand in our measurements. I did not go over into this detail at all. Um, but on large scales, when you're talking about tens of megaparts, or sorry, I use a different, talking about like 30 million light years, 100 million light years, they're, they're kind of one to one. If there's matter from dark matter, there's also matter there from galaxies. And they're kind of, you, they, they map each other pretty well. Um, but when you come to smaller scales, the galaxies interact with each other and they feed off each other and they change the way they look and the way they form, whereas dark matter does not do that. So they start to diverge as you go to scales of, you know, 10 megaparsecs and smaller, uh, or sorry, 30 million light years and smaller. Um, but it's a really a core question that we try to understand is exactly how the galaxies map the dark matter. And what I showed is just the spectroscopic data from the light, but an independent technique that I did not talk about today is to probe the dark matter directly by looking at its gravitational interaction on background light. And this effect is called lensing. And you can actually measure the matter density of the whole universe by looking at how light from background sources gets distorted as it travels through all of cosmic history before it reaches us. So that's another technique that's, that's uh, becoming more and more important. It was not really well done until maybe five years ago or so. I know, make, make up some number. It's more recent development. Uh, but it's really, in the, in, there's a project running in Chile that is really starting to, to make this a systematic way of observing cosmic history that's becoming competitive with us. But it's a different angle. And it's, but it's, it's, it's nice to actually see the complement of the two of them. We'll just take a couple more questions. You had one here. Yes, uh, back to that periodic table, how do we know there are more elements? Are those the only ones we can see? That's so, um, so that's an excellent question. I actually, so I'm, I'm not a chemist. Actually, there's probably chemists in the audience who can address uh, what happens. Oh, this isn't even the full per periodic table. So there's a lot more elements down here that have much higher atomic numbers. Um, and I don't know, actually know what the current status of that is, but all of the ones that up to, what's the highest? 110, 110 or so. Um, we, have, we have had. We have either made or we have observed it in nature. Um, it wasn't always the case. So, I mean, a lot, you know, these are all in numerical order, and so you can definitely put, put a placeholder there. And for, for the various times in history, there, a lot of these boxes were just placeholders. They said, you know, this, this element has 77, Protons, this one has 78. We do, well, that's gold, so we knew about that one. But um, some of these rare ones, you know, like there should be something that has 64 uh, protons, and you could actually make some predictions about what its behavior would be. But some of these are extraordinarily rare, extraordinarily unstable. Um, and so actually isolating them or making them was very, very difficult. Um, so yeah, so we have not always known about all of these, but I think, but all of the ones, I think up through the highest known number now we have we have had, we have, we have either made or we have observed somehow, yeah. You had a question right here. How comfortable are you with the statement that quasars are the first stage of galaxy formation? Um, my colleague, who <laughs> really would be good to answer that, has seemingly left the room. <laughs> <laughs> he saw uh, it coming. <laughs> <laughs> he saw that question coming. He was sitting right there. I swear. Um, I wouldn't say they're the first stage of galaxy formation. It's a, there's a feedback back and forth between the, the accumulation of matter in the galaxy, the turning on of the quasar, the blowing out of gas. It's, it's, and then it, it, the cycle kind of repeats as it accretes more matter as it interacts with other neighboring galaxies. So I wouldn't say it's the first stage. In fact, actually Zheng probably can, I mean, if you look, is my other colleague Zheng here? You want to? He was here too, and he seems to have left. <laughs> so if you look at the, if, okay, so if you look at the universe at very early times, like at a redshift of seven, it's really dominated by galaxies, and the light is coming from really high mass, really young stars. And that's really where most of the action is playing. It's not kind of quasars. Um, but quasars are, black, are the light, or the matter falling on a black holes, and they're coupled to galaxies, so it's really, everything is combined. But it's just the, it's to say that the, the first stage is, is much, it's a much more nuanced question. I would really say, say the most important stage of early times is probably high mass stars and, and star formation of something like 100 mass stars, 100 solar mass stars. Okay, I will uh, take a, uh, 
take a break here and I urge you to come and ask uh, any further questions uh, to our, our speakers uh, after, after we um, adjourn. Um, I have two sets of thank yous to give. The first one is to you for coming and joining us here tonight. Um, I hope you had a really great time. My second uh, thank you is to our speakers. Um, Gail and Kyle, thank you very much. Sorry, I guess I shouldn't clap. I was clapping for you. Thank you. That was really Thank great, you. Kyle. That was phenomenal. Uh, it